thanks for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Beth Walsh Sahutsky. I'm uh, part of the Family Center, um, which is our, um, our sponsoring organization today. Uh, thank you to the Helm for hosting us um, tonight, and thank you to all of you for coming out in the snow and the ice and the cold. Uh, the kids didn't make it to school, but you made it here, so you get extra credit tonight, so I appreciate that. Um, the Family Center of Gross Point in Harper Woods is a nonprofit community organization that provides resources and preventative education to empower families to successfully navigate life's social, emotional, and physical challenges. Founded in 2000 by D Diane Strickler, the Family Center offers programs on a wide range of topics aimed at building strong families and helping parents raise children and teens who will become competent, caring, and responsible community leaders. Tonight, we're honored to have three guests who are going to be presenting to us today. Um, so Janice Abood and Gary Abood um, are from Saga Ed uh, Educators, and um, they are local consultants, um, former educators um, in the public schools for the last 10 years. Um, Janice uh, specializes in special education, and um, Gary was former Teacher of the Year for the State of Michigan in science. Um, so um, they are currently doing private consulting, um, and they actually have information over there to um, your left, and you can sign up for uh, more contact if you're interested. Um, and Amanda B. is from Supporting Counseling Services. Um, she's a, a licensed social worker and um, she has an office um, just up on Mac Avenue and um, she also has information available for you. Um, so feel free to sign up over at the table and um, I really appreciate the three of you coming tonight. Thank you so much and I'll let you take it away. Excellent. Well thank you so much for the warm welcome Beth and thanks so much for having us tonight. Um, again, we're really excited to be here and to share a little bit on a very important topic. Um, one of the things that you see in the picture on this cover is a smartwatch. Now, I have my smartwatch here, and I'm going to try to model for you what we're talking about tonight. And I'm going to set a little timer to help remind me when I need to stop talking. Now, that's really important because one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight is how important it is to have structure, to have function in life with ADHD. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about what this means from childhood through adulthood. And I want to just kind of kick things off by telling you a little bit about what you can expect here tonight. Um, the first thing is that we're going to do an overview of ADHD. We'll talk about from there what it looks like generally in life, in school, and at home. And then we'll kind of close out with some action steps and some next steps for all of you. As you heard from Beth, if you're interested for more information from any of us, please feel free to give us your contact information on any of the sign-up sheets. We'll be able to keep in touch with you as a follow-up if you'd like to talk more or to let you know about more future workshop offerings that we might have. So with that being said, you heard a little bit about the three of us. Um, this presentation tonight is a joint effort. We've been working on, from a few different angles, what it means to support individuals with ADHD, both as children in school and adults in their working life as well. And so we're hopeful that someone in your life can benefit from the information that you take away tonight in this presentation. So without any further ado, I want to kind of kick things off with the big idea of ADHD. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This idea of what we now know as ADHD used to be two separate diagnoses. There used to be ADD and there used to be ADHD. And they have kind of come together in more of a spectrum type of diagnosis. So we don't separate out ADD and ADHD any longer. We have one diagnosis of ADHD, and then it presents itself in a couple of different ways. We'll talk about that shortly. But the big idea here is that this is actually a neurological disorder. Um, it's characterized by a general pattern of inattention or hyperactivity. Hyperactivity has a flip side to it called impulsivity. That's where you're at the checkout line at the grocery store and you buy a uh, national inquirer that you didn't need or want. <laughs> so these are things, though, that interfere in big ways with development or with functioning in everyday life. Um, so again, it's a complex neurological disorder. It really presents, though, as I mentioned before, in three distinct ways, uh, what we call types. An inattentive type, a hyperactive type, or a combined somewhere in between. And so the main two um, distinctions between these symptoms are what used to have two separate diagnoses. They have now been merged into one category for the purpose of treatment as well as care. And so inattention symptoms are generally things such as paying attention to detail, what we might call dotting your I's and crossing your T's. 
listening and tracking with someone in a conversation, being able to keep track of things or dates or time, knowing how much time has passed when you're giving a presentation would be a great attention to detail type of thing. Um, finishing tasks or projects once started. I would say that a hallmark of ADHD is that they, people start a lot of things and finish very few. And the other thing that really comes up with inattention is having a difficulty controlling your focus. So one of the things that I think gets a bad rap about ADHD is that it sounds like this is a, a disorder where people can't pay attention. In fact, they can pay attention really, really well. However, it's what they choose to put their attention on and how much control they have of where that points is a totally different story. And so we often see this present as what's called hyperfocus, getting immersed, getting in the zone, getting overly focused on one thing. On the other side, the hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms are things like restlessness, fidgeting, always being distractible or on the go, tracking with somebody by um, looking at them in the eyes when you're talking versus always looking around, always being picking up on things that are happening in the room, those types of things. Um, excessive or fast talking. I wanted to try to model that for you. I'm not sure if I'm doing a great job or not just yet. And then difficulty waiting or delaying things that you want to do. Um, we call that impatience in the general population, but it does fall under impulsivity. Suddenly task switching, so going from one thing to another without much warning or switching topics in conversation without a transition. And finally, a newer understood area of impulsivity deals with emotional regulation. So emotional surges or outbursts is a big part that has not been known until more recently. So in ADHD, there has been a big development in the way that we understand it. As I mentioned, it went from an ADD, ADHD separation to a more combined uh, spectrum style um, understanding. And as a neurological disorder, it's now understood that there are some other symptoms that come up from time to time. Um, these include fu impairments of the executive functions, things like being able to activate, future plan, organize and manage a number of different thinking tasks, Hyperact I'm sorry, hyper arousal of the emotions, having really strong surges of anger or sadness or gladness, having what we call time blindness, thinking that only five minutes have passed when a half an hour has gone by. Well, I didn't think that it was time to leave yet. It, I was just playing my game for a couple minutes. Um, and then the last two that I think are really important to know about is what they now call an interest-based nervous system. That everyone's nervous system gets activated with things we're interested in. That happens to a higher degree in ADHD. And finally, something that I think um, for me as a practitioner working with individuals who have ADHD, I found this rejection-sensitive dysphoria to be one of the most enlightening features of the disorder altogether. And that is this idea that we have a sensitivity to rejection in ADHD that is much stronger than the normal population. And that in fact, the rejection happens at a neurological level, whether the rejection is there or whether it's perceived. So for example, fear of risk taking can have a much stronger impact in ADHD than in the neurotypical population. Also, having a bounce back from a rejection or a failure or a disappointment is much more difficult. And it's because the nerves in the nervous system is firing differently in this condition. There are three main categories of treatment options that you will see out there. These include things like pharmaceuticals, the more traditional medical options, medication or specialized supplements. There's the therapeutic route that includes different types of therapy or different skill coaching. Um, and that's kind of the category that the three of us fall into. And then there are non-clinical approaches where you can make environmental changes, where you can create and utilize strategies, where you might be able to take advantage of different nutrition or wellness principles that can be helpful for managing symptoms as well. But in general, one of the things that I think all three of us would agree is that there is no one dimensional solution or fix to the symptom management of ADHD that it has to be some combination of the different options that are out there, and it has to be personalized to the case that it's being used to manage. Um, so a big question that a lot of people ask us, so isn't this just like something that happens to little boys who can't sit still? And when I grew up, that's what I thought ADHD was. And I don't know about you, raise your hand if that's something that kind of matches your experience. That's kind of what you thought it may have had to do. Okay, and so the question we get often asked is, do kids grow out of this, or do people grow out of this, or isn't this just for kids who are like Dennis the Menace? 
And the answer is that it actually affects people everywhere and every when in their life. So all different aspects. Um, a lot of people get the misinterpretation that ADHD only affects you at school, when in fact, much like any other medical condition, it affects you 24 seven. So if you had high blood pressure, it doesn't shut off when you leave work. It doesn't shut off when you're on the weekends. ADHD, much like that, affects people in all domains of life and at all times. Now the symptoms may have an easier time being managed in one area or one time frame than another, but it doesn't mean that they are not there at one time or another. So at this time I wanna shift gears to talk a little bit about what ADHD looks like at home, how it manifests and how it can be managed in the home setting. And I wanna focus on kind of two main categories, difficulties that individuals with ADHD would have in their early childhood, middle, growing up years and as adults, and then to look at what are the things that are signs of this condition going on in the background. So if these things are new to you, we would love to be able to follow up and talk and answer questions at the end. Um, if these things are familiar to you, that's great as well. We do have some time for Q&A at the end. So the first one, we'll talk about kind of elementary school and middle school years. So sort of that zero to 12, 13 kind of range. So this includes things like difficulty transitioning between activities or task switching, remembering to start or complete tasks, taking turns in conversations, or receiving criticism or feedback well. And so a lot of different things that these difficulties turn out to look like include the following. So what I would encourage any of our clients to do is to look out for these things. So to notice if your individual is having these difficulties, look out for stress when stopping fun or games or activities. So the difficulty to switch from watching a TV show that you love to eating dinner. Now that can be difficult for anyone, but it could be more difficult with ADHD. Um, Non-stop talking, what we might call taking forever to get simple things done. Like why does it take so long for you to get dressed in the morning, to take a shower, to get ready? Those kind of things. Um, another one that in the early childhood and middle childhood years is needing multiple reminders to do something. And that really talks a little bit about that working memory, how well we can keep things on the top of our mind as we're managing where our attention goes. And then a social implication I think is really important to note is to look for how often are your children at this age talking of, in, of friends that they have, friendships that they have, or being invited to play. So being invited over to a friend's house to play games, to have sleepovers, do all those kinds of different things. These can be great things to look for that again, talk and mark those difficulties that may be there. Moving on to the high school years and college years, you will see these same kinds of symptoms manifest in different ways. These will be things like meeting deadlines or making appointments. So always running late to soccer practice, always missing homework assignments on time, or always being late to a doctor's appointment or forgetting that you have a doctor's appointment altogether. Keeping rooms and backpacks organized is a classic ADHD um, difficulty. And I think that that goes with the executive functions of organization. Moving on, you will see in a lot of cases that this most strongly affects people in school. So you will see difficulty managing academic tasks, finishing turning in assignments on time, but you will also see stress management kind of go under when there are multiple priorities that have to be juggled, whether that's school or work or social, all of those things together can be very overwhelming. Uh, finally, I think in these years you will see personal self-care can sometimes take a dive and you will sometimes see individuals who are unable to put their attention on their own self-care. They put it on their interests, they put it on what is urgent, but they sometimes forget to put it on what's important. And so that can sometimes lead to making it difficult to persist with challenging or even tedious tasks, um, such as in school or at home. So what would you wanna look for in this age group? I think the big things to look for here are in school, looking for missing assignments, and with schedules, missing or late appointments. I think a big piece here is having scatteredness or losing possessions. If someone is always asking their parents, where's my this, where's my that? It's a great indicator of what this difficulty looks for, looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, difficulty regulating caffeine intake, having a short fuse with temper 
pulling all-nighters, staying up really, really late, or waiting until really, really late to do homework or take care of responsibilities. Those are really big signs and symptoms of what's going on here in these years. Now, I will tell you that students who still live at home with their parents have the, um, the opportunity to work with their parents to sort of correct and mitigate some of these symptoms and some of these difficulties. It's when students sometimes get out on their own in college where these difficulties really become impactful to them. And that is because they don't have that normal lifeline, they don't have that normal system that they would have had at home to help make up or compensate for the difficulties that they have. And once they get beyond those educational years and out into their career, these same symptoms persist, but again, in differ different ways. These could be things where you have someone who's unreliable to others. They're not punctual for the things that they say they're going to do. They have difficulty completing tasks or projects when they start them. They actually have a very um, confetti style resume, a lot of different experiences, very short-lived, hopping between jobs or having big gaps between experiences. And in general, this is a newer term, so if it doesn't make sense to you, I'm sure it will in a moment, generally being overwhelmed by what's called adulting. So adulting is a newer uh, fad term that's given to the general responsibilities of being an adult. And so what we find to look for in these years, um, and it isn't to say that these individuals can't be successful too, but they can still have difficulties. So what you look for here is a constant state of hurriedness, rushing, running late, always being late to events that you're going to with them, starting lots of projects, being an idea generator, but having a difficulty closing those out. Again, having long gaps in resumes or being overwhelmed by normal day-to-day -day life expectations and responsibilities. And these things can happen whether an individual is single, whether they're married, whether they have children or not. And so you can imagine, depending on your personal situation, what these might look for in those different examples as well. It may sound like this is a lot. And if it is, that's because it is. This is a lot. And so for a small second, I want you to just imagine that having all of that information put into your brains at once is a little bit like what it feels like to have ADHD. Having all of these different stimuli, all these different ideas, all these different things coming at you at once and having to choose what you point your attention towards and how you organize and manage everything can be very overwhelming. And so sometimes it isn't for a lack of willpower, but maybe a lack of skill power that these difficulties manifest in these ways. And so we do wanna also issue a message of hope tonight by sharing some ways that you can and people can manage these symptoms and get over these difficulties. So regardless of whether you're going the medical, the therapeutic, or the non-clinical route, some tips for managing ADHD in, at home include nutrition, exercise, and sleep. So what does this mean? This means a few things. With nutrition, it means that protein is very key. Carbs are an enemy. So limiting sugar and making sure that you eat a good amount of healthy proteins, especially early in the day. Bacon and eggs is a terrific breakfast choice. So don't let anybody tell you differently. Drinking plenty of water and staying hydrated. When your body isn't hydrated, your brains don't function well, and so that exacerbates conditions and symptoms with ADHD. Exercise is a great treatment option for managing ADHD stress and symptoms. It doesn't have to be a specific type of exercise, it has to more be consistent. Going for a 30 minute walk every day can be enough. Getting that heart rate up and getting that blood flowing is a really great thing. Organized sports and activities are a terrific solution here because what it can do is help create structure and routine for individuals to get involved with exercise and not have to think about and choose what do I do, when do I do it, how do I do it. Finally, I would say probably in the top three is sleep. Um, individuals who are fatigued have difficulty with their cognitive capacity in the first place. If you have ADHD and you are low on sleep, that impacts you even more. And so creating good rituals and sleep routines is a must. Being careful and cautious with caffeine intake, times of day that you do that, especially for individuals who take stimulant-based medications. Limiting caffeine is really important because it can cause an edginess feeling, such as if you drank way too much Starbucks. Um, and finally, one of the things that I think we all agree on is very important is having uh, what some people might call a routine for winding down in the evening. 
What you do before you go to bed has a big impact on your sleep hygiene. And so having a wind down routine is really crucial. So how do you do these things? One of, the, one of the strategies that we work on in our coaching work with families is to create systems, habits, and routines that support these general practices at home. And so those look like four different key areas. Having a place where everything lives and where things get done. We call that a command central. This is a place where you go to to do your work instead of taking your work wherever. A place where you know things will live so that you're not always looking for them. A place where when you are there, you're in do not disturb mode. It's like when somebody might say, I'm going to the office so I can get some work done. So the other part is what we call a launch pad, a place in your home where you're getting out of the house items live, where you don't have to be going, where are my shoes? Where's my coat? Where's my this? Where's my that? Everything goes at the launch pad when you come in and then you pack it up before your end of the day so it's ready for you the next day to leave. A big piece of reminding here is visual. So for the minds of ADHD, visual triggers are really important. So we call visual schedules or putting to-do lists in a visual way a big help. So having a place in your home where you can keep track of things visually, whether it's post-it notes, a dry erase, whiteboard, something like that. Um, and then that also creates some public accountability if you live with others to help you remember and keep up with it. Finally, because time blindness actually affects people quite a bit, we think it's really important to take the general mantra of allowing for extra time no matter what. Assume that you will need more time than you have. So always plan ahead for that. And then a great way to do this is by using what we call explicit timing. Making time visible to an individual is really helpful because their internal clocks are not calibrated to what the wall clock might actually say. And so in general, I think one of the things that often happens with ADHD is that there is a, an interest-based or an interest-driven nervous system. And we are inundated with screens such as these and our cell phones and our watches and all these different items that can sometimes cause so much overstimulation that it does suck us in. And individuals with ADHD have a difficult time pulling that attention away. So I want to encourage everyone to build better relationships with their screens. So this means things like device-free dinner, using smartwatches as tools to let you know what's going on, being able to have a wallpaper lock screen that warns you. So instead of having a picture of your kids, if you're an adult with ADHD, you have a picture with the words, are you sure you want to pick me up right now? Then when you go to pick up your phone to do nothing that you need to do, it will go, it's like somebody telling you, do you sure you want to do this right now? Um, also, we encourage people not to sleep with their phones if they can avoid that and again, to have digital digestion time before bed. So that is, I know a lot, but again, tonight is an overview. It's an opportunity to share some insights and give you a, an idea of what this looks like, how it can be managed at home, at school, and at, in life. And what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Janice, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about what this looks like in the school setting. Thank you, Gary. Um, so we're gonna be talking about ADHD at school. And I think the first most important thing to remember is that um, this trifecta idea. So when we have a child with ADHD in the schools, um, we have to remember that it's, it's, there's, three, there's three loops to success in schools. So first we have school, and we want the school to understand the needs of the child, and we also want them to be able to support the child during his or her school day. Then there's the home piece. So that's the parents, that could be outside support therapists, um, speech pathologists if they're involved, that support the educational and behavioral needs of the child outside of their school day. And then the child, as child's children get older, it's really important for them to understand what is ADHD. It's a condition I have, what do I know about it? What do I need? What can I do? What do I need support with? To help empower them um, to advocate for themselves as they continue through the schooling years. So in the classroom, uh, some things that might be noticeable for a child with ADHD might be a child like Lucy who has difficulty starting or finishing a task in the classroom. A teacher provides a worksheet to start on and Lucy has difficulty just getting her name on the paper or has difficulty finishing the task within the time frame that maybe their counterparts in the class would be. Another child, Ryan, has negative interactions with classmates. Maybe Ryan feels like 
They, she just isn't understood by other kids in the class or other kids perceive how she interacts with them in a negative way. Harper might have difficulty staying in his or her seat. So when other students are sitting working on assignment, Harper is kind of constantly getting up to go to the pencil sharpener or asking to go to the bathroom um, much more than their other uh, classmates. Uh, Summer may be a child who calls out a lot before being called on, so has a difficulty regulating when's the appropriate time to um, participate in class discussions or not always being the first one to respond when the teacher asks a question. Uh, Rocky is a child who might have difficulty finding his materials, so things are left in the locker, things are left in the backpack. Um, in the older grades, assignments or uh, books are left from one class period to the next and aren't traveling with him. And Johnny finally has difficulty turning in assignments. The, the assignments for Johnny may be very easy, but they seem to still be finished and in his backpack when he comes home that next day from school or the same day, and it's a struggle. Okay, so impact of ADHD at school covers kind of six broad areas. So first is that inattention piece that Gary spoke of earlier. So it's difficulty focusing or staying on a task long enough to get it completed. The second would be impulsivity. So that ability to pause and plan before actions or um, words are used. The third piece is hyperactivity. So that difficulty with staying in one place or sitting still for extended periods of time. The fourth one is time management. So that would be that time piece for planning, how long it's gonna take something to do. You know, having that unsure amount of time of, oh, I can get that done and I only have 10 minutes, but the assignment's really gonna take 30 or 40 minutes to complete. The fifth part is organization. So this is where um, students have difficulty just finding their materials. So things are, again, left in the locker or their binder is having an explosion every time you see it. They come home from school, their backpack is overflowing with papers, but they're not in any of the folders or binders. And the uh, sixth piece is that social skill. So again, difficulty making or keeping friendships uh, with friends at school. All right, so some suggested supports at school. Um, these are things that you could talk about with your child's teacher, um, with the school, um, but different ways to help a child or adolescent with ADHD at school to find success. So in the area of inattention, seating, so oftentimes, many people think that seating at the front of the room is the best place for a child with ADHD. That may be one child, but for other children, that can be the worst place because there are children entering and exiting that door. The pencil sharpener might be there. That may not be the best place for them. Maybe a better place is more tucked, you know, sitting in a seat further in the back of the room where it's quieter, away from any noises or distractions. Another way to help with inattention is providing breaks. So the ability to get up and walk out of the classroom or get up and change um, what they're doing for a moment or having an area in the classroom that they can get up and just move in that they know is the area, but allows them to just have a break from things. Um, Gary spoke about earlier too about those visual reminders. So even a card on their desk that has a list of the three things they need to do when they first sit down to start their day. And then finally, just those verbal reminders that are a positive way. I really advocate in this that the child and the teacher have a positive way to re redirect the child. Often the child can come up with a way that they find to be um, the most appropriate and the most, one, most of a way that makes them feel honored in a way that the teacher would help them to redirect if they were off, uh, their attention was off. <clears throat> okay, for impulsivity, again, visual reminders. What are the expectations? Positive redirection, so this discussions in private is so important. Not having a child be called out in front of other kids in the classroom for a behavior, but rather having the child step to the side of the classroom or step in the hall, whatever's decided upon between the child and the family and the, and the parents, um, is really important um, that the teacher understands that calling out the child in front of other people is not gonna help build the child up or help them to um, work on this impulsivity. Um, front loading, verbal reminders. So even when children have been doing the same routines over and over again, it's still really important to remind the entire class of the expectations. So we know there's gonna be a fire drill today. Let's front load the kids and remind them and say things like, okay, what are the expectations that we should all be doing for this fire drill? Instead of 
not reminding, and then children getting in trouble after the fact because they've forgotten or they're heightened because it's a fire drill. That can be really covered for any expectations in the classroom. And signaling is another one. So using verbal and um, reminders, a countdown in the classroom. Okay, eyes on me, five, four, three, two, one. Anything that's verbally and visually stimulating is more helpful than just one way. Okay, hyperactivity. Kids need to move, okay? <laughs> so great things I, I really um, advocate for is having movement breaks for children. In the classroom, again, taping down an area of the room that kids can get up and move around in if they can't sit in their, sit in their seat for a certain amount of time, having that planned out beforehand. Um, there's many different seating options that are um, great for kids with ADHD. Uh, the ability to stand and do their work. Some kids don't want to sit, they would rather stand. Um, having an exercise ball is an option versus a traditional seat. Wiggle seats are a great inflatable um, material that they can sit right on their seat and it actually allows them to move while they're sitting without being disruptive. Um, again, the movement uh, in a designated area and the ability to use fidgets or sensory items. So anything that can keep somebody moving but still working on what they're doing are great strategies. Time management. Timers are great. Um, just to be able to have that visual of a countdown of how much time is available for a task. Um, using planners. Uh, probably every adult in here has some type of way that they still, as an adult, use a planner. It may be on your phone. It may be pencil and paper. It may be a wall calendar. Kids really need that strategy, especially kids with ADHD. They need to be able to visually see what the expectations are. And often this is really front loaded in elementary school and then starts to fade off as kids move up into the upper grades. But it's so, so important because it's a life skill that will carry them through. Um, with assignments, having the teacher um, help the child to break down a large project. So this would be if the project is due on February 16th, Children without ADHD might be able, between the start date of February 1st, be able to do small chunks of the assignment to get it done by February 16th. But a child with ADHD may have struggle understanding what, how much do I need to really get done to be able to have it turned in on that time frame. Um, progress check-ins, so coming around during the class period and making sure that kids are moving through on their assignments. Um, reducing drill and practice. So if a child can show you that they know how to do a specific math assignment in five problems, why are we making them do 20 of them? Honestly, if they can show you in five, they don't need to show you in 20. Um, check and check out system. This is a great um, system I used uh, with uh, some of the students in one of the school districts I worked with where each day there was a designated person that a child would check in with in the morning to go over what they needed to do for the school day. And then at the end of the day, they were their checkout person again, and they would meet with that student, make sure they had all their materials gathered to be able to um, leave the school day and be prepared to do any homework that they still had. Organization. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of one binder versus multiple binders and multiple folders for every single class. And this can be for our little elementary kids all the way up to our high school students. When you have all of these different things that need to be carried throughout the day and going back to the locker to get something and grabbing a folder, the one binder system puts all of the assignments and all of the work in one location and that goes with the child or the teen throughout their entire day and so it's less likely to lose things. Um, digital assignments, the ability to access, which many of the districts have online um, access to work, uh, that's very helpful. Having extra materials at home, um, having a peer support, you know, if there's a friend in the class who maybe uh, organization is their thing, having them work, you know, pair up um, with a friend to get some extra support. And also modeling and showing what you want end products to look like. So your binder should look like this when it's done, or your notebook should look like this, and having those visuals as a reminder to students. Okay. For social skills, making sure that there are clear expectations of group member roles. Sometimes in group uh, situations, kids with ADHD will struggle to know what their job is or what they're supposed to do to participate and be a, group, a good group member. 
So just making sure that there are clear expectations of their roles. Um, if there are social skills groups in, uh, available at their school, seeing if your child would be uh, eligible for those. Um, giving leadership opportunities. Leadership opportunities are great for every kid, not just always the super high achieving um, or very social kid. Every kid can benefit from having a chance to have a leadership role. And then also um, at the younger grades, even a little bit more with peer buddies. So just having that go-to friend, um, especially in working to, um, through any of the social struggles. Okay. Couple apps I just wanted to share with everyone tonight um, that are really helpful um, is first is SnapType. This is an app that allows you to take a picture of a hard copy document. So your child gets a uh, math assignment, for example, and they can take a picture of it. There's a free version and then a paid version. And what it does is it converts that into a digital image and then allows you to actually type right onto it. So if, the, if an individual struggles with writing or getting their ideas down really quickly on paper, this is a really great app for that. The next one up here is ModMath. Uh, this app was uh, designed by a family whose child had dyslexia and dysgraphia. And what it allows is um, to do all of your math work digitally. So it makes digital graph paper allows with lining up, especially at the younger grades where they're doing addition and subtraction, and they've even moved the app up now to include algebra. It has a built-in calculator, it has all the variables for the higher level, and then after the assignments are completed in this, they can be emailed right from the app to a teacher, or uploaded um, depending on what the expectation is for the class. The third app here is Evernote. This is digital note taking. Um, it's really great because it can carry over from a laptop to a phone to a computer. Um, it's another like kind of cloud-based storage, um, but it has a lot of great tools uh, for note taking. Todoist is a to-do list that's digital. Uh, another great tool for just task completion and making sure you're not forgetting to complete things. And then Tide is an app for uh, time management. So it helps you to manage how long things are gonna take. So those would be my five, five apps to check out. I did wanna touch a little bit about support services at the school level um, and the difference between uh, individualized education programs and Section 504 plans. So some children with ADHD um, qualify for either of these two supports. Um, an individualized education program is specialized education programming and related services and supports to meet the needs of an individual. And um, students and children who have these are covered under the um, Americans with Disability Act. Section 504 plan is a support or change in accommodation plan to help the learning environment and to support an individual. Um, so if your child has ADHD and is struggling in your school, um, your next steps would be to contact your child's school principal or their student services or special education director, depending on who is, oversees both of these type of supports, and see the steps to see if your child would qualify for additional supports at the school level. One final thing I did want to mention as um, young children and teens transition to college and trade school, that an IEP does not carry past graduation, um, and a 504 plan can be utilized at the higher grades, um, trade school, college, post-secondary, but this is something that as um, a family and with your 18-year-old would need to be um, uh, self-identified. So the, the college would not be aware of the supports your, your child had um, at the younger, at younger grades, you would have to go into the student services office, providing them the documentation and see what kind of supports would be available to them um, at the higher level. Okay. And then finally, a few additional resources um, to check out to cover some more about um, ADHD in school is Attitude Magazine. They have an online um, website. They put out great articles covering everything ADHD. Um, CHAD, uh, which is an organization for children and adults with ADHD, they as well, they as well have an online presence. And then understood.org has a lot of resources for anyone who struggles with learning and attention issues. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce Amanda, who will be talking about ADHD in life.
Thank you. Bear with me for one second. All right, so my name is Amanda B. Um, and in the introduction, you learned I'm a clinical social worker. I've worked um, in the school setting as a school social worker for about 10 years. Recently transitioned in my own counseling practice in Gross Point Woods. Um, and we've kind of overviewed ADHD. Um, and the one thing that I want to start off with is saying, that if you met one person with ADHD, you have met one person with ADHD. It can look very different um, in different individuals. So I would like to introduce you to my pal, Joe. Joe is a beautiful, big-hearted, silly little boy, but he drives his parents crazy. He has so much energy. He runs from room to room, making a mess of the house, and it takes him forever to follow the directions that his parents give him. Um, a lot of times, just to get out of the house, um, it takes 20 minutes and 20 times of his parents asking to put on his shoes, put on his coat, and finally the parents just end up getting frustrated and doing it for him. Um, when Joe is in second grade, he starts getting in trouble at school because he's blurting out answers, um, or he moves ahead of the class, he gets frustrated with his work, sometimes he'll rip it up, throw it on the ground. Um, he gets sent to the principal's office for getting aggressive with a peer. Um, but what the adults in the situation failed to realize was Joe was trying to hurry across the room to help the teacher and a classmate happened to be in his way. So without thinking, he shoved the little girl to the ground. Um, as he gets older, he has more and more difficulties in school. Um, he loses motivation. He just doesn't really care much anymore. He spends more and more time by himself. Uh, over the years, he's lost his, some of his friends um, for saying just things kind of without thinking, saying abrupt things, and it would frustrate his friends finally to the point where they stopped kind of hanging out with him and inviting him over. He does have a small group of friends though. They're not the best influences. Um, they've started to drink alcohol and he likes to smoke marijuana because it tends to calm him down and it says that it helps him focus. Um, but he doesn't really care much about graduating. Uh, he doesn't really see the point. Um, and he spends a lot of time in his room at night kind of just playing video games and staying to himself. So this is Joe as an adult. He ended up finishing high school, um, but after high school, he didn't um, try to get into any post-secondary education. Um, he was what Gary kind of alluded to earlier, a, a confetti job hopper. He goes from job to job, um, never stays in one job very long, usually because he gets bored um, or he gets written up several times for excessive tardiness. Um, his relationships are still a struggle. He has had several significant others. Um, they don't last very long because he tends to say things, again, rude, abrupt things, doesn't think before he talks, doesn't have that social filter, and doesn't pick up on those social cues um, that his friends and his girlfriends kind of put out to him. So he does um, report some depressive episodes um, just when his life isn't going the way that it should. Um, he does struggle a little bit, um, you know, financially, mainly because he's hopping from job to job. So there are some social and emotional consequences to ADHD. And again, these are just, a gen um, these are just kind of generalizing based off of the research. Um, it does not mean that any person that has ADHD will have these traits, but it is a possible consequence. So um, the research shows that persons with ADHD um, may have lower educational attainment. And if you think about Joe, someone that struggled every day in school, you start to lose the motivation, you start to lose the drive, and then they don't really get, if they do graduate high school, they might not want to pursue anything past that. Um, low motivation and poor self-esteem. Again, just thinking about Joe, somebody that tries really hard for a really long time and continues to you know, not meet that expectation, imagine that. I mean, you would stop trying after a, 
a period of time. Um, there is a higher risk of behaviors. Um, I'm sorry, there's an increased risk of high risk behaviors with an earlier onset. So things like substance use, sexual activity, um, because of the impulsivity that persons with ADHD can have, um, sometimes they engage in those high risk behaviors. Um, they may have fewer close friends. Um, people with ADHD may have difficulty picking up on social cues, um, engaging in conversation, um, so they tend to um, suffer socially. Um, there can be long-term economic consequences. Again, it kind of can be related back to that lower educational attainment. Um, it can be related to the job hopping, um, but they can suffer financially because of that. And there has been links with increased criminal activity with persons with ADHD. Some other consequences, there are um, increased comorbidities of other mental health disorders. So adults with ADHD, 50% of them report periods of anxiety. Um, there's increased depression. Adolescents with ADHD are 10 times more likely to experience depression than those who do not suffer from ADHD. And children with conduct disorder, 30 to 50% of them also have ADHD. There's an increase in dysfunction cognition. So that's ma any maladaptive behavior or poor um, coping mechanisms. Again, when we're dealing with that high frustration level, um, sometimes they don't always choose the best behaviors to deal with those external stresses. Um, and there's also emotional dysregulation. So Gary alluded to this earlier, increased mood swings, aggressive tendencies and outbursts. So I know that seems pretty dark and dreary, but it is not hopeless. Treatment has been proven to significantly reduce the impact of these negative outcomes. Um, there was um, some researchers that did a review of several studies, and they found that in 72% of the studies that they reviewed, persons that were treated with ADHD had better outcomes than persons that were not treated with ADHD. So this just kind of helps us show that treatment does work. So what are some treatment con considerations? Again, you meet one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. So it has to be highly um, tailored to the individual's unique needs. Um, there are some persons that um, might not have social problems. There are some people that do struggle with social problems. So things that should be considered um, are parent training, specifically um, if the individual is diagnosed when they're younger. Um, there are parent supports that can help. Um, medication is always an option to consider. It's not always, a, it's, again, it's a parent's choice and it's not always something that um, some families choose, but it is something that could be considered. Um, skills training, so both social skills and executive functioning skills. Both counseling and behavioral therapy can be beneficial to deal with those motivation issues and um, social skills and low self-esteem. Educational supports that Janice um, discussed earlier. And then education regarding ADHD. I think the biggest thing with that is teaching um, a person that has ADHD about what they're experiencing can help normalize some of that and then create um, a sense of self-advocacy to where they can then you know, make sure that their needs are being met. So here are just some next steps, um, and these are things that we've kind of talked about throughout the entire presentation. If you or someone you know or love, you suspect them of having ADHD, the first thing to do would be to seek a medical evaluation. This can typically be done by your pediatrician or family doctor. They may refer you out for psychological testing, but the first thing we always do is to refer families to their pediatrician or family care doctor. Um, after that, you kind of decide on the needs that um, you know, the person has, and you can consider executive function or academic coaching. Um, if the child is in school, especially if they're um, having issues, 
definitely consider educational advising. Um, and last is counseling or behavioral therapy. So in my practice, um, any family that I work with that has a child or a person with ADHD, we kind of work to create supports together. And it's a very collaborative approach. Um, so it's something that I, I ask the whole family to be part of because unfortunately, a person with ADHD can affect the functioning of the entire family. So we really try to work all together to create the best supports both at home, at school, and out in the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that pretty much wraps everything up. Um, is there, we'll open up, I guess, to question and answers. If there's any questions um, for anybody, we would be happy to answer them. Yes? What is educational advising? Educational advising. Do you want to speak to that, Janice? Yeah. Because I know that's going to be your... So that would be supporting a family not. as they work with their school, their district, um, in terms of making decisions or working through if the child has a 504 um, or if they have an IEP, just providing supports to help um, maximize the supports they're getting at school that are most tailored to them. So. I still don't get it. Okay, um, so I, sometimes you might hear of it like advocacy. So it's supporting if you're, if you're going into a meeting and your child has specific needs that you want help with another, you know, somebody who knows the child but isn't working with the child at the school. Let's say they're working with them outside of the practice. Mm -hmm. Supporting the family to um, maximize the success of their child through so the who, process. Who would do that for me? Uh, this school district. What's that? Oh, th these these are things that we, as our as our um, as part of our business, would be a part of. Oh, yeah. So th this is uh, just to add on. So this is an outside service that would come into school and come alongside families to be able to help advocate in those meetings with the school mm -hmm. for the services that the child needs. Um, it isn't to say that parents can't advocate for their child. But sometimes having someone who's got the education lingo or experience in that setting can help communicate and sometimes make those conversations uh, more um, powerful. And so they can also help make sure that the parents are empowered to know what they need to do and what they need to say to be able to get the most out of the services that their school would offer. And Saga educators do that? We do. We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you do it on college level? We do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so for example, helping um, students set up IEPs at a high school level or helping college students to be able to set up accommodations with their university or their college or their school is something that we can do alongside the student if they're 18 or older or alongside the family if they're under 18. Is this coaching outside of school as well? Like at the home and life? Yes. Yeah, so the skills coaching that we do is available outside of the school day and very much like somebody might work with a personal trainer on exercise and fitness, we work with them on the cognitive skills that are challenged by ADHD symptoms and help them to develop systems and habits to be able to compensate for those symptoms and manage those symptoms in whatever area of life. So we do the house call model and we go to our clients, either to their homes or to a third location like a library or a cafe, um, typically working with them in the home rather than an office for our work we have found is helpful because we can make recommendations that are environmental based and be able to work with the family together rather than in isolation with one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So um, at uh, my child's school there was a psychologist that came that uh, like, uh, a seminar to teach the parents what they're working with, with, the, with the teachers and, and the students at school. Uh, do you do visits to schools to kind of work with the uh, special special teachers at school? Because some of the things that you pointed out were don't do this, don't see the child at this row or whatever, see them away on the twice. Uh, these are things. Uh, do, would you do training with the teachers at school? Because I'm thinking I'm not an educator, I'm a parent, but for me to be telling them, like I noticed something's wrong, that I'm down, like wait a minute. You as a professional should be knowing this. And I, a lot of the stuff makes sense. I'm reading it, I look up, I research it. But for me to tell an advisor that you know my son's certain 504 or whatever, 
do you guys do, like if I was to recommend them to call you to do like a, a training for their staff, mm -hmm. would you guys, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think all three of us are available and, and able to do okay. that. And we've all been in different capacities, part of doing staff development yeah. for schools on a variety of topics. And so that is definitely something that you know all three of us can collaborate to be able to offer um, workshops for schools um, or for teachers outside of schools if there was a okay. another setting. But you know, just to, to add on, one of the things I heard you say might fall into the category of student advocacy or family advising, where if it's personalized to one student's experience and teachers are having difficulty meeting those needs that are known and have been communicated, that would be maybe more a family advising or an advocacy type mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. um, because then we can work with that specific situation. Right. If there's a more persistent issue at the school level, then it certainly can be recommended to you know, um, a school leader to consider training for their staff to be able to provide some of the education that Amanda was talking about so that there is a wider awareness of some of the things that we've talked about here tonight. Mm -hmm. What is um, this spectrum that everybody is talking about these days? Like, I mean, I understand that there's a lot of similarities in ADHD versus like autism, but I know that it's like not the same. But I just, I just hear this spectrum thrown around a lot these days, and I don't understand it. Well, I think the word spectrum can be used um, about different diagnoses. Typically, it goes along with the autism spectrum. Oh, yeah. um, and when um, the, the new diagnostic manual that professionals use, like psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers use, to create these diagnoses, um, it came out a couple years ago and it kind of changed categories of these disorders um, and they started using like the autism spectrum. Um, and so when we talk about like the spectrum of ADHD, it just basically means that while a person may have ADHD, it can look very different in different people. So you might have one person that has ADHD that's extremely inattentive, but they can sit in a chair and just stare off in space. But then you have another person with ADHD that is moving, is, you know, can't sit still, gets up out of their seat. They both have ADHD, but it's on very different ends of the spectrum. And so while typically the term spectrum is related to autism, um, I think that it's being used more to discuss other um, diagnoses because you're seeing a lot of different characteristics kind of under the umbrella of a diagnosis, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, what causes ADHD and why does it seem so much more prevalent now than it did, say, 20 years ago? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it is it is a neural biological, so it is an imbalance. Um, it's a neural excuse me, it's a neurological um, imbalance, um, and that's why with for some people um, medication is necessary. Um, we have seen a spike in the rates of ADHD, but the jury is still out on all the reasons. Um, some people contribute it to screen time and increase in technology. Um, unfortunately, I think the research is just starting to come out on that because it is something so new. I think in the next 10 years, we'll kind of see more linkages if there is a link between ADHD and screen time. Um, there's also some speculation. Again, the research isn't really good about it um, with the changes in food processes. So we're eating a lot more foods that are processed um, in different ways. And they think that that might have a, a link to some changes in our, in our brain's chemistry. Um, but unfortunately, I think that a lot of this is still yet to be researched or in the process of being researched. Um, but anybody who has been around kids, looking at kids 25 years ago, I think there was always that, that person that had ADHD um, and maybe it just wasn't categorized as ADHD. It might have just been that rambunctious little boy that didn't listen. 
Um, and now we know that there is a reason for it. So I think that there's also been some enlightenment and education around ADHD, um, which kind of creates more um, of a, a cre creates more attention around it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was gonna say my husband would say that who is almost 60 now that he has ADHD when he was a kid, but it just wasn't identified as that. Mm -hmm. And so then the question for me too is, is, is it hereditary? Yes, they, they have yes. found genetic mm -hmm. links. Yeah. So if, if you do have um, a child that has ADHD, a lot of times you will see um, links in one, one or both of the parents. Um, but in your case, you know, um, they didn't cl classify or diagnose um, students back then with ADHD. And so sometimes you just lived with it. And only now I have parents coming to me and saying, you know, like, I have all of these classic symptoms as well. I've struggled with it. These have been the consequences. Um, and now they can kind of label it and put a name to it. Um, and they're finding then that their children are being diagnosed. So is it ever too late to be diagnosed? Like, like things that you describe as my husband. Is it too late to take them to the doctor? It's too much. <laughs> Tommy's yeah. the husband. <laughs> I don't think it's ever too late because all of the treatment considerations that we discussed can happen at any point in their life. Obviously, he might not need educational um, advising, but he could need career advising, especially if he's a chronic job hopper or goes from job to job. So that's something that, you know, Gary or Janice could definitely kind of help build those skills and build an awareness around those skills that could prove to be beneficial. So no, it's never too late. So uh, part of the children's therapy that I've done with my son is um, are under insurance and you go to behavioral therapy sessions and co and whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you categorize under that as part? Because a lot of the stuff that we've, we're recommended for all the way to sales and I'm struggling trying to find things local that can happen within an hour drop up and pick up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Things that um, are you, is your practice um, billable in insurances and, or is that just like an out-of-pocket uh, service? I think we can each speak to that. Amanda, do you want to speak to yours? Um, so I do accept some private insurances. Um, I'm in the process of being paneled for some additional, so there's some information over on the, the table that has insurance information for my practice specifically. Yeah, and at this time, our firm is private pay only. Okay. Um, we do hope in the future to be able to consider the accepting of insurance. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not there yet, don't have that capacity at this time. Oh. But all of us are local, so yeah. to your second <laughs> part of your question, yeah. you don't have we're to go to Rochester. Local, yes. <laughs> yeah, we are like, not driving an hour yeah. between schools. Right. right. Amanda, um, do you specialize? In ADHD, in practice? Um, I specialize in working with children from ages 4 to 18, um, specifically around, more specifically around anxiety, but I do have, like I said, 10 years of experience um, working in the public school setting, so I have a lot of experience working with children with ADHD, um, and so it's something that, yeah, I absolutely could help with. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and another question. In your slides, you referred to um, supportive counseling, which I understand, mm -hmm. and behavioral was it counseling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, um, especially um, in the school setting, um, they might uh, recommend a behavioral plan, but that's something that can also be considered in the home setting as well. Um, a lot of times, um, persons, especially children with ADHD, struggle with behaviors. And whether it's you know inability to control emotions or just their impulsivity, and so I would work with families to create behavioral plans at home to work on those behaviors to become more functioning. Have you seen any situations where um, older children or young adults uh, take themselves off medication or decide? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need it, and then what does that look like? And 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to speak. I can speak to it yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I, in my most recent work in schools, I worked in a high school, and I did have so, um, a lot of teens, actually, that wanted to take themselves off of medication. There's a lot of bad press about medication, and some, some of it is rightfully so, but um, as a student gets older, they have access to more and more research and information, and um, their choice is sometimes to take themselves off of medication. Um, with additional supports, they can continue to be successful. Um, those additional supports would look like additional school supports, additional home supports, maybe counseling um, in addition to all of that. I think that it can spiral out of control if you just go cold turkey off of the medication without recognizing the need for those additional supports because their behaviors, their impulsivities, their moods will change once they're off that medication. Yeah. And I don't mean to get like super personal with the group, but to be honest, like being medicated most of my life and transitioning off, I mean it really is back to the number one part, like one of the, you know, slots that you had about nutrition, exercise, just really transitioning mm -hmm. properly, mm -hmm. and career-oriented, being in the career that really suits you mm -hmm. and that you can do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't know if it's right or wrong that I'm unmedicated, but I'm not. But it is, if you transition properly, I think. And ADD, everyone's different. Right. You know, mm -hmm. every single person mm -hmm. has their own story. So right. I don't know what it happens. Well, we appreciate you sharing that, yeah. too. Yeah, absolutely. That's okay. Yeah, and, absolutely. No, and I think, you know, we've seen in our own practice that we have individuals we've worked with who have taken themselves off of medication. Some have had to go off of medication for other health reasons that um, in some cases, some of the medications aren't appropriate for the individual and they, with their doctor, figure that out. But I think, like we said earlier, it isn't just a, oh, um, that it's not a one-dimensional solution. And so, like you said, Making that decision, we would always advise anyone to talk with their health care providers and not to just make that decision cold turkey or alone, to make an informed decision and to figure out what else needs to be adjusted because with or without it, it doesn't make the condition go away and so those symptoms still need to be managed. Will that be different when you're an adult versus a seven-year-old? Certainly it can look different, um, but like Amanda said, having more education, more savvy and more strategies that's something that you also have that you gain with age. And so some of that um, is kind of that comprehensive picture. But we've seen, I think, in our practice, both positive outcomes from um, discontinuing medication as well as challenges that were unforeseen that arose from discontinuing medication. But in either case, something has to be done to adjust afterwards, and we would always advise someone to make that decision with their health care provider as well. There's also the issue of abuse of stimulants and yeah. abuse of mm -hmm. medications. It mm -hmm. seems to be a really growing problem right. where you're using an Adderall for a one night cram or whatever, mm -hmm. and pretty soon mm -hmm. you're using it for a tool that leads to addiction. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it does happen sometimes like that. Uh, and unfortunately, in the teen and young adult population, that often happens where that's taken We're using recreationally. Other medications. And, and that's, and that, right. yeah. yeah. Or and it is, yeah, it's not usually the, the person who's prescribed the medication mm -hmm. that has, um, that abuses the Adderall, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes the people around them, or yeah, medication swapping yeah. can sometimes Or swapping a prescription medication and coming off of that and then choosing another mm -hmm. substance to fill the void. Mm -hmm. Or aggressive diagnoses, too, that leads to a larger dosage, perhaps, than right. it's needed. Absolutely. The tolerance effect. Yeah, it, it, there definitely is with some of I would say, you know, not, I, and all of us kind of have a really, comp, uh, I'd say, complex view of the treatment process. One thing to know in terms of medication is that um, none of us are medication providers. We're not healthcare mm -hmm. practitioners in that way. So we would always encourage you to find either a physician or a psychiatrist who to, to talk about those things with. But one thing that we can also direct people to is educational materials. Where can you learn about the options? There are vastly more medication options now that are a lot more nuanced yes. than there were 20 years ago. Right. You know, the, the percentage of people diagnosed in childhood was 6% of the population in 96, and it was about 10% in 2016. So there's an increased prevalence in it. 
Is that because we have better ability to catch it, we have more of a social acceptance of it, because we have more treatments, people are coming forward and saying, okay, we don't know, but there are a lot more options now that go beyond the stimulant medications. And so knowing that that's an option can sometimes be helpful for parents who might say, I don't want my kid on Ritalin. That drug has been around for decades. This diagnosis has been around for decades. Our attention to it is much greater now than it's been ever before, but the options to be able to support individuals with it, I think is also there. And that's a helpful thing to know too, is that the medication is also not one dimensional, just like treatment in general. Uh, to add to them, if they were to get off medication, I was told that uh, once a child uh, goes through therapy and learns to go through their own mechanisms and find something they're actually good at in life, their, their natural drive will kick in, or they don't need as much of a dosage to get them to focus their passion about that career or about that hobby that they automatically, because if they're excited about their natural drive will kick in there, not needing that medication on certain days or whatever, and certain, you know. Um, so like you reduce between 50, whatever the dose is. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and that goes back to that interest-driven nervous system, that when you can find those things that would compel someone to, have, to, yeah, that you're good at, that you're interested in, you know, it's, it's partly your competence zone and it's partly your comfort zone. When you can operate in that, it's, that sweet spot does tend to make everyone operate much better. And so that, I think, plays to the interest-based nervous system and allows individuals to function more optimally in that setting. Is there a question over here? Have you seen um, people grow out of it, mature out of it, yeah. as they get to be young adults, et cetera? Wishful thinking over here. <laughs> I, mean, I, think it, I think it's like learning the strategies and learning to cope with the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, as you get older, sometimes that in a impulsivity, um, the hyperactivity will slow down. I mean, just think about you as a, as a person, as you get older, you tend to slow down. I think that that would happen as well with a person with ADHD, maybe not to the extent that it does to you or I. Um, but I think that it's really just people learn to cope with the symptoms. And so while it might look like they're growing out of it, they may still have ADHD. They're just learning how to deal with it and they learn strategies that work for them. Um, unfortunately, some people learn poor coping strategies that actually are a detriment, but um, you know, I think that it is possible to overcome a lot of these things with the right strategies and supports. Um, follow up to that. Uh, it's been suggested that uh, ADHD children are on average maybe like five years behind on a maturity level. So at 10 to five, at 15, they're 10, so then Eventually, doesn't that sort of that spectrum catch up to the individual? So at 25, mm -hmm. they're now a functioning 20-year-old adult, right. if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be true in your experience? Um, I don't know that I would say like five. You, you make that as it's a pretty big generalization, um, but I do think that. You know, like we talked about, there are some deficits and delays in social skills, which when you're young, that's a big part of learning. Um, there's some deficits in time management and executive functioning skills. Um, when you're young, that's a big part of learning. And so I think that while there is a slight delay, again, learning um, how to cope and accommodating those delays, or I don't even call them delays, but those symptoms, um, I think can help a person catch up maturity-wise. But yes, I think that once you get into adulthood, once everyone's kind of functioning as adults, you know, you could be a very successful, high-functioning adult and still have some issues with ADHD. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, I just want to thank uh, Gary and Janice and Amanda for a really amazing presentation. Um,
and I want to remind you that if you're interested in more information from um, either of our presenters, um, there's more at the table there. Feel free to sign up. And please remember that um, really this is just the beginning of our winter-spring um, season of presentations through the Family Center. Um, so make sure that you take a flyer on your way out and look at some of the other things that are available. There's resources available on our websites for um, Association of Professionals, which all of these guys are part of our Association of Professionals. We're happy to um, connect you with some resources that you might be looking for. Um, and uh, to be a resource for you in our community. So thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.